In this lecture, we're going to finish up chapter 28, covering sections 8 and 9. All right, so we're going to look at the magnetic force on a current-carrying wire. Now, uh, in the figures, we have a flexible wire pass, uh, excuse me, a flexible wire passes between the pole faces of a magnet. Now, only the farther pole face is shown here, right? This is our magnet. Without current in the wire, the wire is going to be straight, as shown in this figure here, right? I mean, you can pass a magnetic current through the wire, or excuse me, a magnetic field through the wire, but if, if there's no current, if there's no moving charge, um, then you're not going to have a force. In the second one, it shows that with an upward current, the wire is going to be deflected to the right. All right, so remember, this is our magnetic field here. The dots mean that it's coming up through the page. All right, so magnetic negative field is coming up through the page, and you have a current, right, and this is the direction of the positive charge going from the bottom to the top. And that's going to give you a force to the right, so it's actually going to push the wire a little bit to the right. Now, in the last picture, this is with a downward current, so the deflection is going to be leftward, right? And you can do the, the right-hand rule to kind of figure that, that out. The uh, connections for getting the current into the wire one end and, and out of the other end are not shown. Okay. So let's consider a length of wire, L, uh, as shown in the figure here. All the conduction electrons in this section of wire will drift past this plane at xx in some amount of time. right? And this, this should actually be a subscript here. So this is the time is just the length divided by the drift velocity. And this, this of course, comes from our velocity is equal to distance over time. Right, so the, the distance in this case is our L, it's the length of the wire, and we're going to use our drift velocity. Because um, we know that electrons are going in all directions, but the general drift of the, of the electrons or the, of the charge um, is going to be along the current. Okay, so thus, in the time, a, a charge will pass through that plane. It's given by, so the, the total amount of charge would then simply be Q is equal to our current times the time, right? And our time we were given as the length divided by this drift velocity. Okay, so that means we can see what the force on this wire is going to be. All right, so our force to the, to the magnetic field is going to be Q times our drift velocity times the magnetic field times the sine of theta. Now if I plug in what I just found for Q, we get our current times L divided by our drift velocity times drift velocity times the magnetic field B times the sine of 90 degrees because uh, the angle between our velocity and our magnetic field is going to be 90 degrees in this case. Everything's going to be perpendicular to each other. Okay, well this simplifies out nicely for us. So the that goes away. This just goes to 1. So the force from the magnetic field is simply the current times the length times the magnetic field. right? So it's the current running through it times the length of our, our segment of wire times the magnetic field. All right? Now, if we pull that sine 90 back into here, we know this is going to be sine of, of the angle. So say the um, magnetic field was not perpendicular, Right, our force is simply going to be our current times the cross product of L cross B, where L, again, is going to be the length in the direction of the current uh, crossed with our magnetic field. Right, so this is going to be the force in a current. Okay, so again, L is going to be the length vector, and it has a magnitude L directed along the wire segment in the direction of the current, right, in the direction of our conventional current, which is the direction of the positive charge flow. Now, if a wire is not straight or, in, or, or the field is not uniform, we can imagine the wire broken up into small straight segments. The force on the wire as a whole is then the vector sum of all of the forces of these little tiny segments. So let's just say we... Oops, let me go back there. Let's just say we broke this up into a bunch of little segments. 
right? little length segments like that. And you could add all of these up with um, this differential limit. Right? So you just say that it's the, uh, the differential of the force is equal to I times the differential of the length, and then integrate across that. Okay. All right, so let's do an example problem. Um, a straight horizontal length of copper wire has a current, I is equal to 28 amps, through it. What are the magnitude and direction of the minimum magnetic field B needed to suspend the wire, that is, to balance the gravitational force on it? Okay, they give us the linear density. So they don't give us the length or necessarily the mass, but they do give us the linear density. So we can use that. Okay. Well, because the wire carries a current, the magnetic force uh, can act on the wire if we place it in a magnetic field B. So to balance the downward gravitational force, Fg, oops, so we have Fg going down, right? And we have our, we can make it so that our uh, magnetic force is going up. All right, so the direction of Fb is going to be related to the directions of B and the wire's length, L, right? Given by this equation that we just found earlier. Okay, so because L is directed horizontally and the current is taken to be positive, Right, so the current is coming up towards us, up out of the page. Um, the right-hand rule is going to say, this is going to tell us that B must be horizontal and rightward. Right, so if we put, if we say that our current is coming up out of the page, point our fingers up, and then we curl them around to where B is. Right, so we curl them around to the right. That's going to give us a, our thumb pointing upwards. Right, so that's where our our force <clears throat> from the magnetic field would be. All right, and that's where we want it, right? Because we want it to balance out the, the gravitational force. Uh, okay, so the magnitude of Fb is going to be simply given by ILB sine phi. Again, we just found that earlier. Because um, we want Fb to balance Fg. So, if we say that Fb is equal to Fg, and we know that our FB is just going to be the current times the length times the magnetic field times the sine of theta is equal to mg, right, which is just our force of gravity. Okay, now we also want the minimal, minimal field magnitude B for FB to balance, right? We don't want... Um, we want to make sure that our field is not too great and it's not too less. Thus, we need to maximize our sine phi. To do so, we set phi is equal to 90. All right, this is our theta. All right, I've been using theta. Um, thereby arranging B to be perpendicular to the wire, right? So we're saying it's straight off to the right. Okay, so then we, when we have a sine of 1, the equation is going to give us... All right, so we just take this equation and we're solving it for B, which gets us mg divided by I L sine of theta. Now I can rearrange this slightly and take this m over L out. So now it's m over L times g divided by I. Remember this was just sine of 90, so this was just going to be 1. Uh, and we did that because we're given what our mass per unit length is, right? We're given our linear density as 46.6 grams per meter, right? So now that we have our mass per unit length, we can just go ahead and, and plug in that value for that and without knowing what the length is or what the mass of the wire is. Okay. So we're going to plug in our values. This is going to be 46.6. Uh, times 10 to the negative 3 because I need to make sure I convert that to kilograms. It was in, it was in grams previously. Times 9.8 meters a second squared for G. And then divide by the current, which is 28 amps. Okay. So our value for the magnetic field is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 2 Teslas. Right? That turns out to be about 160 times the strength of Earth's magnetic field. Okay. 
All right, the last section we're going to do is talking about the torque on a, a loop of current, right, a current loop. Now, uh, so the elements of an electric motor are shown. Uh, the rectangular loop of wire carries a current and is free to rotate about a fixed axis. Um, it's placed in a magnetic field. All right, so a magnetic field is going from our north pole to our south pole, so it's going across to the right. Right, and we're running our current through this loop of wire. We're running currents being run through like that. Now, a computator not shown reverses the direction of the current every half revolution, so that the torque always acts in the same direction. Right, because if it flips over, you're going to reverse the direction of the torque. So you have a device that actually um, <clears throat> reverses the direction of the current, which is actually very similar to AC power, right? In the previous lab we did DC, which was um, direct. Well, AC is alternating. Right? That's basically the idea here. If you spin a coil through a magnetic field, you, you can even induce a, a alternating current, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Okay. Um, so the two magnetic forces, F and negative F, as shown here, so you have a force going up on this loop, right, and then a downward force over on this loop because of the directions of the current, are going to produce this torque on the loop, tending to rotate it about its central axis, right? So it's sort of going to rotate in this direction. Okay. All right, so... To, to define the orientation of the loop in the magnetic field, we use a normal vector n that is perpendicular to the plane of the loop. Now, in the second figure, it shows the right-hand rule for finding the direction of n. All right, so if our we're just going to basically curl our hands around where the current uh, around the direction of the current, and where our thumb is is going to show you where the direction of our normal vector is. Now over here you can see the loop that we're talking about. It has four sides that are all labeled. It shows you if we have a, a, a magnetic field going down into the page, which is what all of these X's are showing, it's going to um, cause all of these forces here, right, in various directions. Right? And then we'll see that the overall torque is in a, in a, a specific way to, of rotating. Okay. Um, so in the third picture here, the normal vector of the loop is shown at an arbitrary angle theta to the direction of the magnetic field. Right, so this normal vector isn't necessarily going to be in the direction of the magnetic field because it's going to be rotating. Okay, so um, for side two, the magnitude of the force acting on this side, right, so if we just look at side two, which in this picture it's here, Right, and you can you can see it as here. This is going to be our second side. The length of it is b, right, the distance b. So the force on it is going to be i times little b, which is our length, times big b, which is our magnetic field, times the sine of ninety minus theta. All right. So if this if this is theta. Uh, we want to know um, the sine of the angle of 90 minus theta. All right, and 90 minus theta is simply going to be cosine theta. So this is simply going to be I, B, B, cosine of theta, right? And this is actually also equal to F4, right, which is on the other side. Right, so this force is going to be equal in magnitude to this force. Okay, so F2 and F4 are actually going to cancel each other out. All right, so you're not going to get a rotation um, between F2 and F4. Now, forces F1 and F3 have a common magnitude of IAB, where again, A is going to be the length of the side, that's just our L. And this third figure shows that these two forces do not share the same line of action, um, so they produce a net force. So you can see they're, they're actually a little ways off. And the, so the distance away from um, 
the axis is going to be this bit right here. Right? So if you extend your axis down to here, here's our distance away and here's our distance away. Right. Okay. All right, so the torque that they produce individually, we're just going to call torque prime, is equal to uh, the first torque plus the second torque. All right, so that's going to be I A B. And remember, torque is going to be force times a distance times the sine of the angle between these two vectors. So it's going to be FD sine of theta. All right, so here's our force. That's our force right there, right? I times the length times our magnetic field. And then the distance is going to be B over 2 times sine of theta. Right? And it's B over 2 because think about if this loop went all the way down to here. So let's say that if this loop was, let me erase some of this stuff here. Right? If you rotate it back this way so that it's flat against here, right? then you have a force in this direction and a force in this direction. And this whole length here is B. Right? So the max that it can be is B over 2. Right? That's going to be the distance of our, of our arm here. Um, but then it's going to, of course, decrease as you start increasing this angle, as you start going back that way. Okay, so, um, so that's why it's B over 2, sine theta. Right? And then we're going to add the other force on the other side. So that's I, A, B, and it's the same thing, b over 2 sine theta, and they're additive, so they're going to add together, which means this is just i a b big B sine of theta. Okay, so this would be, uh, if there was one loop, one coil of wire, this would be the torque on it. Right. Now, if there's n loops, which means there's multiple loops of wire, all right, um, and the area is, is going to be AB, right, just the length times the width, uh, the total torque would then be, we'll just use regular T for the total torque, it's just going to be N times RT prime, right, so you just multiply however many coils you have, so that's going to be N times IAB times the magnetic field times the sine of theta, okay, and again, we say that AB is just going to be the area. So we end up with NIA B sine theta. All right, so this would be our total torque for a multi-loop uh, wire, all right, multi-coil wire. Um, so now that we have this as area, this can be any area. It doesn't necessarily have to be a rectangle. So you could have a circular coil, right? So our circular coil would simply be ni pi r squared times the magnetic field times the sine of theta is equal to the torque. So it just depends on what, <clears throat> what the geometry of the object is. Okay, that is it for this chapter. We'll see you next time.